And okay, folks, we're all being recorded. It has been a joy and a privilege. And one of the things that we're going to do, um, so this is called Gathered at the Table. It's an opportunity to look back, to look forward, and we'll have five different sessions, and I will have five different co-hosts as we go along the way. Today, I'm really excited to have Sally Hare as my co-host, and Sally is the Dean of our faculty and is a, the previous board chair president, and um, it just seemed uh, good that as we have um, kind of geared next year's faculty assignments around our mission statement, that we start with the beginning, which is the phrase to be and become, that I sit with Sally here in that process. So we're gonna, um, we're trying to do a couple things here. One is we're looking back at this book and it's called Gathered at the Table. And if you're interested in this book, um, after we talk and, and you just think it's going to be the best read you've ever had, you can um, send a note to me, Jean R, or let's do it this way. Send a note to Janet L at Kirkridge.org with your address and a way to make a payment of $20. And we will um, send it out to you at some point, um, like soon. So. So this is the book we're gonna base this on. It's called Gathered at the Table. So this book was for our 75th anniversary. And it's based on our mission statement to be and become a people of hope, compassion, justice, and service. So these five talks will be based on to be and become, hope will be one conversation, Compassion will be one conversation. Justice will be one conversation. Service will be one conversation. You know, and as I reach the end of my, my tenure as executive director at Kirkridge, it's really just about, you know, one of my favorite things is to gather around a table and just to be with people that I've never met, be with people that are old friends, be with people that I see once a year, be with people I see more times a year, and just have that opportunity to have either coffee together in the morning or maybe a glass of wine at night or just be around a fire and telling stories. So this is that opportunity, um, probably for me to tell some stories. And um, I am delighted to be with you. I wanna open this time, um, with the opening poem from this book, which is called Gathered at the Table. So let's all get a little bit centered. Put your feet on the ground. It's so good to see faces I know, faces that are new. Take a deep breath. Breathe into the space where you are. Breathe into your own heartbeat. And just a reminder again for everyone to mute, that would be helpful. So gathered at the table, this is by Michael Glazer, a former board member. He starts with this quote, we need to be brave enough to invite our contradictions to the same party as our commitments. Here at this table where intuition sits proudly beside logic and scientific analysis has loosened its grip on rigid exclusivity. Here where excitement of the unknown replaces fear as if at a dinner party where we know that whatever is served will warm its way into new questions to explore. Here, where mathematics of ideas does not deny the interior of our lives. Here at this table, we host each other, what is and what might be. Here, where excitement of the unknown replaces fear, as if at a dinner party, 
where we know that whatever is served will warm its way into new questions to explore. I thought that was an appropriate place to begin this conversation about to be and to become. So I'm gonna start the conversation with land. Land holds our DNA. And at Kirkridge, we sit on the ancient lands of the Lene Lenape peoples. The Lene, Lene Lenape peoples are also known as the Delaware peoples, and they were called to live in, in um, hold on, let me just get my act here. So the Lene Lenape people or the Delaware peoples as they were called now live or lived in what we now call New Jersey, parts of New York, Eastern Pennsylvania and Delaware. In the 1860s, they were pushed off these lands um, in the walking agreement by the son of William Penn. And they were forced to move to Oklahoma, Wisconsin and Ontario. Although a few of the Lenape Lene Lene people still live in Pennsylvania. When I, when I've read about these people, what it talks about is their generous spirit, that they were peace-loving people, that they didn't believe in building walls, and they lived all along this Delaware corridor. So to understand our history, we have to understand our DNA. To truly know who we are, it's important to know that we're standing on the land of our ancestors and those who have come before us and listen to their voices speak to us. Now to further understand this land, you actually have to go back 300 million years ago when this whole area was underwater. And this whole mountain, as we know it, was part of the Pangean continent, the great continent. And in the middle of that continent, and oh, I'm so glad that my friend Sandy Miriam is here because she will correct me. But see how I do, Sandy. In the middle of this continent was a central Pangean mountain mass. And 65 million years ago, that mass began to break up. So as Sandy's explained this to me, think of it like a paper in an accordion. And as it separated, those land masses form mountain ranges in four regions. And now I'm gonna show a wonderful map that Sandy shared with me. So catch this. So there it is. That's the split of the Pangean supercontinent. And if you look at it, you will see that these mountains that split apart are in the British Isles. They're on the Eastern side of Greenland. They come down into Nova Scotia and they come down our Eastern seaboard as well as the Western edge of Africa. So these stones, this mountain mass are all the same stones. In fact, there's an international um, Appalachian Trail that starts in the British Isles, comes across into Greenland, down into uh, Nova Scotia, and down into Maine. So why is that important? Well, it's important to me because it took me years to figure out Kirkridge. And I didn't understand Kirkridge until I understood that its origin was from this small island called the Isle of Iona in the Scottish Hebrides. And its inspiration came from a man named George MacLeod, who prior to World War II started to think um, that the Church of Scotland at that time, so we're looking now at the early 1930s, that church had grown out of uh, had started to separate from, from the daily life of people in Scotland. 
they were suffering after the first world war their towns and like glasgow some of their factories had been destroyed and it was like how do you take faith and put it into daily action and so George McLeod began to form a new type of community where he brought together individuals of people who were laymen, people who were clergy, people who were craftspeople. And he wanted to try an experiment. He called it the great experiment, where he invited them to live in community together and to do what he called a common demanding task. Actually, it was a demanding common task. I always mix those up, demanding common task. And for him, it was to rebuild the cloisters on the island of Iona. The cloisters were the, the community area of the abbey. And that particular island um, has been seen as a thin place, as a sacred place for centuries, back, back to the 600s actually. So why is this important? Because the land on which one stands on Iona are the same stones that one stands on when you're at Kirkridge. And I understand now that why it was that a stonemason from Dumblane, Scotland moved his entire family to Bangor, Pennsylvania to build walls like he built on the island of Iona. He built the same walls with the same stone at Kirkridge. And this is important to me because it's crazy to think about that in the cloisters on the island of Iona, he rebuilt the cloisters but he also used the very same rock and stone to rebuild the wall at the farmhouse. It reminds me that we are just but dust. We are, we are just a minuscule of the story. And it's important to know this story. So this is a land that invites us to be, to be. And it's why we talk about how important it is to be on the land, to walk on the land. You'll hear the land as important. It's because it has this ancient connection to some mystery that we don't really understand. So George McLeod called Iona a thin place. And one definition of a thin place is where you can walk in two worlds, where the worlds are fused together, where you can feel the spiritual in your daily life. And that's what I think this land gives us to be. So I want to focus on the word. So I'm focusing on just to be. What does it mean to be on this land, to take time to breathe it in? to bring in air into our lungs and exhale it out. What does that mean? To take space that when we breathe in standing on this rock, that we actually increase our capacity for compassion for ourselves and for compassion for others. The word breath, comes from the, the Hebrew word for breath is the word ruah. And ruah means breath or spirit. So when we take time to breathe, we take time the, for the spirit to enter into our lives. We begin to heal and to expand, to let it in and exhale it out. It is, I think I said this as, as Paul Tillich said, the ground of our being. So I find the land here at Kirkridge sacred and the invitation of the land for us to come and walk and be with it and to find our breath, to catch our breath in a world where that is difficult to do is the invitation here. The second thing about what I think about this land at Kirkridge, it makes it very unique and special is that it's a land in common. 
nobody owns this land. There's not a church organization. There's not another organization that oversees it. Nobody owns this land. This land is a gift and a common gift for all. I think it's probably the most unique and fascinating fact about Kirkridge that nobody owns it. It's passed from board to board, from staff to staff, to director to director. And mysteriously, it continues. So to be, to be on the land, to breathe with the land, to listen deeply for our capacity to love, to include, to be with, not apart, for in the end, we all came from dust and we will return to dust. So now let's move to become, to be, to become. We become both in our solitude and in community. They are together. Our origins and inspiration are drawn from this man, as I said, George McLeod, who envisioned a community that still exists today called the Iona community. John Oliver Nelson, who was the founder of Kirkridge in the late 1930s, like many other clergymen, and they were all men at the time, um, were inspired by McLeod's work and they, so ins and they so inspired him that he began to look for land in the US. And he found this mountain and it reminded him of Iona. It reminded him of Iona. He found this mountain, it reminded him of Iona. Sometimes I think about, you know, did the land choose John Oliver Nelson or did John Oliver Nelson choose the land? For both of these men, the building of community was key. And it wasn't about sweet community. Rather, it was community that was gritty, that was real, that crossed class, education, belief systems, and understandings. It was a community that put faith into daily practice and work. Now, after their first summer, they were like, fallen apart. They were beginning to blow apart because they didn't have anything to hold them together. And so they created what they called a common rule, George McLeod did. And for them, it included worship, study, prayer, common work, and purpose. McLeod believed that in order for community to survive, to survive it needed a demanding common task where they were all needed, all were needed, and they felt important in their role. For Kirkridge, this demanding common task gets formed and reformed as people come and go, find their way here and move away or find new paths or pass away. The demanding common task is not defined once and forever. It's up to the community to define that task for each other. And community is messy. And it is the call for each of us and every one of us to find home on this mountain. Community is what our call is. We're on the land. We believe the land is common. We invite community and we become community because we find that important. This land is a gift. We put out a welcome sign. We welcome old friends and we discover new friends. And with the whole community, within the whole community, there's smaller communities. Some who have existed for decades, communities many of us have never met, communities where we all find home. It's shifting, it changes, it's not always the same. It's an alive, it's an alive being. Living and holding community is not easy and that is our call. One of the greatest gifts I've had as the director is to move in and about and greet and share meals and conversations with all sorts of programs and communities who call Kirkridge home and each is part of the whole. It is this combination of land being called into ourselves, to listen to ourselves, to hold our own shadows, to hold the invitation we breathe, dream, vision into a much larger and bigger possibilities to who we are to become. 
So to be, to be on this sacred land and to acknowledge its history, its DNA, its sacredness. It's part of this Kittatinny Ridge. It's called the Endless Hill that runs just all along this hillside. It is what, when people come here, they, they, they come out and they'll take a big breath and they'll just breathe. And it's like, so we want people to be here. We want to share this gift. It's as if we hold a sanctuary for the world. Um, I often call it a national park for the soul. I know some people don't like that phrase, but for me, it's the best phrase to capture this essence of it is like an endangered species. People would love to purchase this land, but this land is not for sale. This land is for us all to share equally and to be a part of equally. And the becoming part of that is this, is this um, invitation that we don't come here simply to be in solitude. That is a choice for some people when they want private retreats. And that is so understandable in a world that is so hard and difficult and challenging and pushing up against us. Yet we come here to also be restored to go back out into the world. So all of our buildings are shaped like lighthouses. The meeting space is shaped like lighthouses. So you can look out into the world and never be separated from the world but the world also speaks to you. It's a two-way street. So that also has to do with hospitality and extending welcome. And that also has to do then with hope, compassion, justice, and service, which we'll get to. So Sally, do you have anything you wanna add at this point? And I'm gonna mute because I don't wanna echo. I think for the most part, I will um, save what I have until um, after you give us a chance to talk to each other. Um, but I, I, I will say that um, I'd heard of Kirkridge for many years before I met Jean, who invited me to Kirkridge, and that the thread um, that, and I love this thread, Jean and I at the time were both courage facilitators following the work of Parker Palmer. And we met at a facilitators gathering. And what I didn't know, I'd, I'd heard of Kirkridge from Parker Palmer for many years before I got to, to visit Kirkridge. What I didn't know, Jean, then was that when you came for your interview 17 years ago to be executive director, you brought Parker's book with you. And that part of your vision was to thread what we like to call the courage work through Kirkridge. So I'll just sort of put that out there as um, we begin to move into the next part of Kirkridge, thinking about the being and the becoming of the, the shoulders we stand on, but also the being and becoming and the vision for what's ahead. Well, since we have just a few more minutes, I'm, I'm gonna, say a little bit more about kind of our roots and our heritage. One very important thing about our roots and our heritage um, was it was, there's two things. One, it was, it was based at that time um, in Christian tradition. So the name Kirkridge is Kirk, which is church on the ridge, Kirk Ridge. In the over decade and decade and a half that I've been here, we've really looked at um, wanting to, to talk about how do we expand that gift of hospitality? How do we expand that invitation to people of other face and no face? And this is a question that's going on in every community I know that is an Iona, Iona inspired community. And so, the Kirkridge board and, and Kirkridge programming has, has worked to expand that and to say the welcome here is to all, all who need rest, 
time for renewal, community, in order to go back in the world for justice. That is the common bond. It is what is our inner work doing to move us back out in the world to do whatever it is that is our call for justice. And I think that marks us different than other retreat centers. And literally a half an hour ago, I got off a call with the four other Iona inspired retreat centers, three of which are in Canada. It's one in Tatamagusha in Nova Scotia, one in Five Oaks in Paris, Ontario, one in Naramata in British Columbia and ourselves with the, the leader of the Iona community. And together we're doing a program and we've done one and we're gonna do a second one in two weeks. And it's amazing that we can gather. And I said this morning, it's as if we speak a common language because we don't have to translate. We know the roots from where we come. The second thing that, that in I'm doing a project right now, looking at all these centers, and I didn't realize how deep the roots of pacifism were here. And that's not to say everybody who comes here is a pacifist. That is certainly not true. But what's important is to think about, George McLeod was a, a naval officer in the First World War when he got, and he was of a family that had some rank and stature. When he got out, he became a fat pacifist between the First World War and the Second World War. The founders of many of these communities, which were, a lot of them were founded right before the Second World War um, or, or during, they were also pacifists. They wanted to work for a world of nonviolence. That's not the litmus test. For me, the litmus test is they saw it important to stand up against a world that only knew one way to speak of another way. And those other ways are ways that, that we use at Kirkus, you know, like for justice, you know, what's it mean to work for a more equitable world? What does it mean to be involved in our communities to work for the end of redlining or racial equality or LGBTQ movements or inclusion of people who live with disabilities? What does it mean to move up against what the world says is the norm to say, no, we wanna offer a different way. And I think that's what these centers do continually. And they're redefining that all the time. That is not a static piece. But this particular center had a lot to do with the anti-Vietnam War movement, a great deal to do with it. They also had a lot to do with the LGBTQ movement. Um, we were welcoming people here in 1978 who were people of faith who found themselves to be um, exiled from the church. And we have continued to be that home for a long time. We now welcome people here with, um, who live with intellectual disabilities and autism. And you know, when I came, they were strangers, but they're not strangers anymore. And our task as we stand on the land and as we soften our hearts, and as we expand our vision, is to make the welcome even wider. And I don't know where Kirkridge is being called next. That's what we're gonna explore. That you know, maybe we have some ideas around this table of what it is that you would like to see in the future and how it is as a community we're called to envision into the future together. So with that, I think we're gonna divide you up for some small group conversation. So you can meet each other just as if you were at a coffee pot and you decided to go off into a corner and have a little one-on-one -on -one conversation. So we're randomly gonna just divide you up in groups of three or four um, and invite you just to simply reflect on what does it mean for you to be? And where in your life are you becoming? And if you have time, what, that might, what does that mean for Kirkridge? We're gonna ask you to be together for about 15 minutes, maybe 20. Let's see, we have lots of time. So let's do 20 minutes. Let's do 20 minutes and then we'll, then we'll come back and be in conversation. What does it mean to be? 
What does it mean for you to be? And where in your life are you becoming? So all you need to do is click that join button if it's shown up. And um, we're going to give you 20 minutes. So at 120, you'll be invited back. Hey, Gene. Sorry, hey, I, I, clicked, I clicked the wrong button. If you can put me in and I, I just put a hey, note in the yes, chat. I I think I'll I can. Stick with that. Yeah. Thanks. This is very rich. I can't put you in. Can Justine, can you put her in? Maybe I need to. Um, Tony, do you see on the bottom right corner where it has that breakout? You can pop that box open again. You should be able to. If you clicked not now, you can. Click uh, yeah, I might have made that impossible. Maybe I need to okay. to, to exit and come back. Um, Lamara can you no, know, I think Lamara, Lamara, if you go up to Tony's name and go to more. Good to be here. Hey, Janet. Well, no. As you're returning from your small groups, I want to welcome you back. Um, I'm Sally Hare. As Jean said, I am Dean of the Faculty, and I want to tell you a little bit about what that means and who the faculty is. But before I do that, I want to invite anything that perhaps really touched you in the breakout room, anything that um, made your heart sing. So if there's anybody that could share, um, what was it in, in that breakout room that made you know that was exactly where you were supposed to be? I'm going to jump right in. <laughs> like this, Carol. It's such a safe place mm. at Kirkridge. And that's all I want to say. Thank you, Carol. Anyone else, any insight into being and becoming? Abigail? Yeah, I. Um, what you said is in terms of that energy coming off of knowing I'm in, the, this is being in the right place. Um, as I shared with my, with my group, basically just added on to everything that Jean said. Um, and already when Jean was talking, because I don't know much about Kirkridge. I'm actually in France, and um, but I and I heard, I know a little bit about the Isle of Iona and that story. But the connection with land and the connection with um, becoming and being, and I'm trained in psychosynthesis, which is a European um, branch of transpersonal psychology, and and all of this started to not just interest me intellectual when Jean was speaking, but I could feel that warmth just coming right up through my body. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, like talk about being in the right place at the, wow, how did this happen? And then in the group, it was just wonderful to hear that corroboration of what she had said by the, the three people that I was with. I, I mean, it's like, I suddenly started feeling Kirkridge is obviously one of these thin places, just like the Isle of Iona. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you, Abigail. Thank you. Sally, this is Michael in New Mexico, and I had the privilege of being with Marcia, Lydia, and Pear, and the, the common threads and the common ground uh, and uh, the care for Kirkridge. Um, Lydia came with her family uh, as a child. Marsh has been a former board member. Pear is now a space sharer uh, with this incredible program. Um, and so I, it was wonderful just to think about the, the common ground of 
of spirit and art and health and wellness uh, and and being on the land uh, among our group. Um, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of the contributions they make and the, the connections of art and spirit uh, between Lydia and Marcia and storytelling and writing and then pair with uh, helping folks with substance uh, issues to come and be a part of the land and experience healing. I mean, you know, it was amazing. Um, thank you for uh, placing us in conversation with each other. I, I felt like I was in a group uh, to listen and learn and be inspired. Thank you, Michael. It sounds like you were truly gathered at the table. Thank you. I think one of the things that, that I'm hearing um, from you affirms something that I've come to know during the last two years of the pandemic. Yes, Kirkridge is a place. And yes, Kirkridge is a thin place. But Kirkridge is also more than a place. That these kinds of things can happen on Zoom. Two years ago, I said we're not possible. And yet, when the pandemic literally shut Kirkridge down, I was doing a retreat there on the, the Friday before the Monday that the governor shut everything down. And Jean and Justine said, we're going to begin to move our programs to Zoom. And I said, oh no, you can't do this kind of work on Zoom. Well, I have come so far in the other direction that I don't ever want to totally give up Zoom because I know that that's part of what makes Kirkridge accessible to people that it would not be accessible to otherwise. And the thin place I've come to understand really is that field of consciousness. And we touch that when we're together on Zoom. We touch it in ways that I'm learning so much about. I said earlier that I first heard of Kirkridge from Parker Palmer. Um, and I love Parker's insight about creating space because I think it's a lot about what Kirkridge is. Parker said, or actually he wrote in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, that we know how to create the spaces that invite the intellect to show up, analyzing reality, parsing logic and arguing its case. Such spaces can be found, for example, in universities. We know how to create spaces that invite the emotions into play, reacting to injury, expressing anger, and celebrating joy. They can be found in therapy groups. We know how to create space that invites the will to emerge, consolidating energy and effort on behalf of a shared goal. They can be found in task forces and committees. We certainly know how to invite the ego to put in an appearance, polishing its image, protecting its turf, and demanding its rights. They can be found wherever we go. But we know very little about creating spaces that invite the soul to make itself known. Apart from the natural world, such spaces are hard to find. And we seem to place little value on preserving the soul spaces in nature. I think one of the things that I love about Kirkridge is that it's not apart from the natural world. And when I'm there, I remember that I'm not apart from the natural world either. I said earlier that I have the privilege right now of being the, the dean of the faculty. The faculty emerged from a group called the Kirkridge Courage Fellows, a group of almost 30 of us who for two years were in retreats together at Kirkridge because we wanted to be in places where the soul could show up so that we could go deeper into our own work as facilitators of what Parker calls circles of trust. At the end of two years, the fellowship was supposed to end, but nobody was ready for it to. So it went on for two more. And at the end of that time, we began to emerge into what is now the Kirkridge Courage Faculty. 
So those mm -hmm. almost 30 people are now a few more than 60 people. And particularly during the pandemic, Jean likes to say that the faculty have helped Justine and Jean feel like they weren't alone on the mountain because we would all come together on Zoom. And it's been quite amazing to watch that. I remember as a board member, when I first came to Kirkridge, um, probably about 10 years ago, the motto of Kirkridge was still the same as it had been for almost 70 years, that it was about picket and pray. And that was very powerful. But we also knew as we were approaching the 75th anniversary and we were trying to reach out to people that we've never touched before, as Jean was talking about, people of all faiths and people of no faith, people of all ages, that picket and pray might not resonate in the same ways anymore. So we had deep conversations about how what we wanted to change our motto to so that we could really begin to understand and begin to name what Kirkridge is. And we knew that it was about being and becoming. You, I can only tell you that it felt like we'd never land on those four words of compassion, hope, justice, and service, but we did. And I love that that's where we are now. And the faculty has just decided um, we're also having deep conversations about language, but we've decided to create four departments. One of the things that was clear at the last faculty meeting was department may not be the right word, but it's a good starting place. But those departments are the departments of hope, compassion, justice, and service. And one of the things that we're already realizing is that those four can't be separate, that there's an intersection of those at Kirkridge. And also we realized that the lens of each of those is too important not to consider them on their own. So Jean's plan for the next four sessions of Gathered at the Table is to invite one of those department chairs to be with her for each of those sessions. So on April the 13th, Vita Goler, who's the department chair of HOPE, is going to join Jean for Gathered at the Table. On April the 27th, it will be Estrus Tucker, who chairs the Department of Justice. On May the 11th, it will be Martha Timberlake, who chairs the Department of Compassion. And on May the 25th, Sandy Merriam, who's here with us today and chairs the Department of Service, will be with Jean. So our hope is that you're going to come back for each of those sessions, because what we know is that the vision for the future is emerging. For the last year or so, in our faculty meetings, we've been using the word cottywample to describe where we are. When you cottywample, you move forward, but you don't know exactly where you're going. And that's felt particularly as we were shut down um, about the right way to talk about where we were. So what's emerged out of that are these four departments that aren't four departments at all, but perhaps are four intersecting circles. And we'd love to have all of you with us as we dream and continue to create what's going to come out of that. I wanna open this up now to your thoughts and your questions, whether they're questions for Jean or for anybody else who's here. I know we have some board members here. We have at least one of the department chairs here. We have some of the fellows here. So let me just open this up and see if you have questions or comments that you'd like to share.
Well, Jean, I guess I'd like to pick your brain while we still have the chance to do that. Um, and I just wonder if any wisps of hopes for Kirkridge have arisen for you, uh, directions that seem intriguing. Um, I, I just wonder what's arisen as you're preparing to close out this phase of your own work. Gail, thanks for that question. Um, let me start with actually the end of the book for George McLeod, which where the author says the best is yet to come. I really believe that's true for Kirkridge. Um, we're in a world where land, especially land that's as beautiful as what we sit on is scarce and it's being bought up and being privatized. I think it's a radical act that this land is held in common. And we don't know all that that means, but it certainly is a guide for us as we move toward the future. So I'll start there and then say, this land is underutilized. I think Justine and I were so sad during the pandemic. You know, we'd stand here and, and there, were, there was no one sharing this land with us except the four leggeds, which was important. But in a world that needs to learn how to breathe again, we need to extend welcome in a wider and more in a way that invites a hearth space onto this land that we haven't had for a long time. I think one of the struggles that I've had as a director, and I think Justine would agree with me, we were talking about it this morning, is, is that it's lonely here. So we need a group of community people to be here and, and um, to, to be like the welcome crew, like the hearth space where people can be welcomed in from the hardships of their lives. Um, another vision for me is um, to be responsible to the planet. We have old buildings and old facilities. How is it we can be more responsible with those facilities and be more, um, be more energy efficient in what we do? And how do we educate people who come here about that in their own lives? Um, and then I think the last is I look at Janice Fialka, I will say we need to keep widening our community of who is important in our world. Janice and I both share a son, we, we share sons who are friends that live with disabilities. And this is a community that we ignore. And is, by the way, a community that George McLeod recognized in the 1930s. He was friends of the person who began the Larsh communities. No, 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 not the Larsh communities, the um, Camp Hill communities in Scotland, Camp Hill communities in Scotland. But that also came out of the Second World War. Um, and he recognized the importance and the gift that people who live with disabilities make to the world. And one of the things we have at Kirkridge is we have two people who live with disabilities on our board, one of which is Janice Fialka's son. And you know, Micah and Ernie give gifts to this board. They remind us to slow down. They see things in a different way than we do. And as we continue to expand who we welcome, uh, another one that I'll highlight that we're welcoming this summer is Michael Aidy is leading a program to welcome parents and guardians of people who are, uh, of children who are gender differing questioning maybe if they're trans. That's a hard world out there for those families. And yet Kirker just said, welcome, come here. You are welcome here in this mountain. This mountain can hold you. So Gail, I could go on forever. And you know, one of my biggest learnings is to pass on the baton to say, I can't live into this. I would have loved to have created an intentional community here but I didn't have the energy or the bandwidth during my time. But maybe in the time in the future, you know, I'll plant the seed of an idea and we'll all plant seeds. That's the thing, it's not just me, it's all of us planting seeds of ideas of what might be possible. And um, 
And it's not just going to be one seed that takes hold. So thanks for the question. Thank you so much. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> I see faces on this screen who have their own Kirkridge stories. Um, Pierre, would you like to, to speak? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would. My, uh, my name is Pierre, um, and uh, we have office space there at, at Kirkridge, um, the Sync Recovery, Synchronicity Recovery Foundation. And we are working with people with substance use disorders, getting them out into nature and showing them the power of nature and health and wellness and exercise and social connections and uh, spirituality and and um, we stumbled upon Kirkridge just by I think I sent Justine an email and she said yeah come out check it out we're looking for new ways to to expand and and uh, we instantly connected um, and you know my my this is more of my hope than a question but my my hope is that we continue to grow there and and um, you know there's a lot of people with substance use disorder and and uh, mental health issues uh, in the Lehigh Valley and uh, getting them out and showing them the power of Kirkridge and the power of connecting with other, other people. Uh, I'm seeing very beneficial. Like every person that's walked onto that property is going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And can feel the energy, right? Because there's energy there. It's just, it's there. Um, so, you know, I guess that's, that's my seed I'm planting um, that I hope grows, that, that what we're doing there uh, grows and, and that we continue to, to have retreats there and continue to have people out there and continue to have programming there. Thanks. Pear, I, I'm we're grateful that you're here. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the mystery of the land and where you landed. Because that seed was planted decades ago. Because Turning Point used to be a residential recovery center. And it was named Turning Point. And if you want to get even a little more eerie than that, if you look at the plot of land to which Turning Point is placed, so Kirkridge is made up of a whole bunch of plots of land that were bought up over time, right? It is a freaking arrow. It is an arrow, like go this way, that shoots up the mountain. So there is, I'll, Pear, remind me to show you sometime. I, I, I was just amazed when I saw it. So it is turning point. It was a residential center and the seeds now are reblooming. Yeah, I think there's always been a history there with, with substance use and alcohol use um, with some of the, the people that have gone through Kirkridge. I, I, I've been reading that in the history that, that's, that's gone all the way back into the 40s. I will say that one person on this call I've known for a very long time and probably within the first six months of my arrival, he walked me back in Turning Point meeting room and he picked up the um, serenity prayer and he said, this place saved my life. And he turned it over and he said, see this, this is my signature. So I will let that sit unless that person wants to speak to that. Well, that person is me. Um, I know some of you, some of you don't know me. My name's Cap Whitney and I live in Dublin, Ohio. I've been coming to Kirkridge for 35 years. Uh, yeah, um, learn to be. I certainly, that, that serenity prayer, that, that room, I, I, it is so aptly named for me because I literally, my life literally turned around. I met God for the first time in my life in the turning point in January of 1987 at a John McNeil retreat. And um, um, I was, at the time, a deeply closeted gay man. And six weeks later, I came out. And that began a whole cascade of 
what began a recovery journey, a spiritual awakening that's directly out of the 12 step program, but it couldn't be more aptly named. Um, and as I've said earlier to the small group I was in, and I've said this to Jean many times, when I go to sleep at night, I always vision looking out that window or standing on the land in front of it, standing on the land uh, of that uh, Delaware Water Gap and looking up at the hills in New Jersey. Uh, and somehow I get a little bit of a feel of God holding me tight. And uh, if it hadn't been, there's two things. If it hadn't been for the 12 step program and the serenity prayer, I wouldn't be alive today. And um, for the guys that started the 12 step program back in you know, the 30s and uh, for uh, uh, Oliver Nelson and, and uh, certainly the directors I've known, uh, Bob and Cindy and, and Jean and all the people I've met there, um, the power, uh, in fact, I think I wrote that in that the end of the, for the 75th anniversary, that it's like, if I'm there with 40 people, there's a power of about 43 or 44 people. It's, and I you know, you can say the hand of God, but it's just multiplies the goodness, the courage, the, the getting in touch with who you are uh, and examining it and loving it no matter what it is because it's who you are, it's your reality. Um, I, I too could go on and on, but uh, yeah, that was, that was me, Jean. <laughs> Thank you, Cap. Could I say something again? So I have not been to Kirkridge yet. As I mentioned, I'm in Southwest France right now. But as I listen to what everyone is saying and, and starting with the way Jean kind of set the stage and the history and the, and the, the soul of Kirkridge, um, I, I just am, I don't know, blown away, I suppose one could say, by the, the, the threads of, of great wisdom traditions coming together. As I, as I mentioned, my background's in psychosynthesis, which is a form of transpersonal psychology started by an Italian psychiatrist who was a student of Freud's. And psychosynthesis is now known in the United States. There's an association for the advancement of psychosynthesis. One of the big, big books, Asad Jolie was the founder of psychosynthesis, but his biggest student was a person by the name of Piero Ferrucci, who lives in Italy, who's still alive today. Asad Jolie is no longer in this world. Um, but Piero Ferrucci wrote a book, What We May Be, which has been like the biggest book for anybody interested in psychosynthesis, not just counselors and, and therapists, but people that are that use psychosynthesis as a way of exploring who they are and, and what they may become. That's the whole thing about psychosynthesis. It's not just analyzing you know, your past and the conditioning and your pains and all that. But it's, it's, it's moving, it's exploring that potential and who we may be. And as I listen to what you've been sharing here at Kirkridge, again, that warmth, that excitement is, is bubbling up in me because it's, it sounds so much like helping and giving tools for people, for all of us to explore who we are, how we may be now, who we are becoming and how important that is to, for the world today. As I mentioned in my little group, you know, we take so many things for granted. I live in a beautiful area as well too, but it's being changed so quickly now um, because of greed and people needing to cut trees so they can ship the wood, particularly to China, who pays the most apparently. 
and and you know as we see that what happened and what's happening in the Ukraine, it doesn't take much before pacifism disappears in front of violence. And if we don't know how to hold our ground, we don't know how to speak out against it. And we get run over. The world can be run over, we're seeing. We, we live in a global community. It's not just Zoom that's shown us that. I mean, it was a global pandemic and it still is happening. And things are accelerating. And I'm so just happy and to hear that there is not just a place, but there are people that are all from different traditions and different paths. And, and for instance, the Camp Hill communities and, and all of this is part of things that I'm interested in and been working with. And, and all I can say is blessings. We've, and, and we must, the courage, uh, these courage communities or courage circles, excuse me, that you, you, that you mentioned. I mean, we must keep with this. We must keep going. We must support each other. And I am so excited <laughs> to come to Kirkridge. <laughs> um, I have to just, I can tell you, I mean, I'm actually applying for, I've applied for the, for, for Jean's position. <laughs> I call it Jean's position now <laughs> to take over because I'm so excited with, with what this organization is about and moving into the future with it. I mean, this is exactly resonant with, everything that I believe in and I've been doing for the last 30 years. And I can't believe I've been able to meet people online that are that are part of it, you know, not just working with a board or, I mean, I was, I'm looking forward to working with the board, but I'm saying to be part of hearing people's stories and what it means and, and I, I just wanna say thank you. And I stumbled on this and I said, well, I'm gonna do one of these online to get a feel for the organization and boy oh boy was that the right thing for me to do thank you so much you know one of the things i, I i'm on the board at kirkridge um, and um one of the things we envisioned when we knew we were in a time of transition you know a time of of becoming but also a time of um deep reflection and in really not wanting that to be a small space that just jumps from, oh, someone's leaving and someone's coming. But how can we really expand this space and invite as many people as possible in? Because this, this, this is a thin moment for Kirkridge where the spirit is really meant to come and, and spread wide and interweave new connections and with old connections. And I feel that happening so much here. And I just want to say to kind of both everyone here, everyone who's re received the invitation, but somehow didn't make it to the Zoom or whatever it is to put that, that the voice out that um, this is part of, of what we want to do is, um, you know, we're not filling roles. We're we're inviting the spirit, and we're inviting vo new voices in, and hopefully, no matter where everything ends up, a year, five years from now, this process will have open, have gathered a bigger table. I love, I, I love being at Jean's table and I, and that she's gathered this table here. Anyway, I just, I'll stop with all my metaphors now, but I'm, I'm very, very happy with, um, to be in this space and to encourage anyone who's even for a moment come to love Kirkridge to, uh, keep spreading the word and stay, stay at the table. I love that, Kathy, and, and I love that I feel that sense of being gathered at the table with each and all of us, and I look forward to the next sessions. Um, Jean, I'm going to pass this back to you to bring a, today to a close, but not at all to, to bring gathered at the table to a close. <laughs> 
Well, this has been a joy. I was kind of nervous at the beginning, but now I feel like I know you all a little bit. And so that the table's only gotten larger. Um, I, I want to close with a with qu three quick things, I think. I think it'll be three. One, um, I pulled this off the kitchen while, while you guys were in small group. Oh, you all just went sideways. So my, did I go sideways or did you just go sideways? You did. There we go. Now you're back up. Okay, there you go. Um, this is going to be backwards for you, so I'll just read it. You know it. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, Margaret Mead. We are small communities, but we are powerful and we are vibrant because we're rooted and we're rooted, I believe, in the land and in each other. Those are important. It's land and each other. Thought one, thought two. A wonderful man named Rustam Roy he used to call me up on the phone. He was part of all these movements at the beginning and he was one of the original Kirkridge people. He's a brilliant physicist. He used to call me on the phone and engage me for hours. I learned more about Kirkridge and Rustam than anybody else. And he used to say to me, Jean, here's the struggle. You inherited a place, you inherited an organization that was supposed to become a movement. We sit on that balance point. We are both a place and an organization, and we are also a movement. We have to be a movement. We can't just be a place, because if we were just a place, we'd be stagnant. We have to be both an organization and a movement. And so with that, I will close with some of the words that I have read over and over again, which are not my words. They are words from Robert Raines, who was the second director here. He used to greet groups saying this, and I, I just, I love the beauty of his words. He says this, like Chaucer's pilgrims, we are stopping over for a couple of nights to rest in this inn and tell each other some of the stories of our lives. If we look around and consider the pain, beauty, and yearnings of all of our lives gathered in this room, it constitutes an enormous human treasure. Look in this room. It's an enormous human treasure. And more than that, this is important. We are not alone. We do not start de novo. Myriad souls have been in this place, leaving some residue, some DNA of their spirit. There is a cloud of witnesses, a communion of friends, known and unknown to us. Our quote, balcony people, as Carlyle Marnie put it, rooting for us and cheering us on. If some of you brought demons with you, remember that the angels are with you too. This mountain welcomes you. This ancient rock, that has been here 300 million years. Whatever sin or sorrow, grief or anger you've brought, the mountain is not appalled. Kirkridge, church on the Appalachian Ridge. It's seen and heard it all. It's one of the arms of God, one of the arms of God, where it's safe to lean a while. So thank you. I'm glad we were able to lean for a while, lean with each other, see the beauty in this gathering, what a treasure we are as human beings, walk in this journey together and welcome to the space, the place, the virtual movement of Kirkridge. And it's so good to be with you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Jean, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Juanita. Thank Thanks, Gene. Thanks, Sally. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank you. Need some green chili for me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.